The Big Tech Podcast, brought to you by Sky Broadband. Get the power to do more with Sky's best ever Wi-Fi, with lightning fast speeds rolling out to a million homes. Hello and you're welcome to The Big Tech Show with me, Adrian Weckler, the tech editor of the Irish and Sunday Independent. And I'd like to thank Sky for sponsoring this broadcast. I'd also like to thank Modern Science for allowing me to be here during this podcast because I had a tooth pulled about 48 hours ago. And by this point, I really did think I was going to have the chipmunk cheek and wasn't going to be able to talk. I still would have turned up and talked because the guest I have uh, this week is Helen Dixon, Ireland's Data Protection Commissioner. Helen, you're very welcome to the podcast. Hi, Adrian. I'm glad to hear you're recovering from that tooth trauma. You know, I'm actually amazed because at modern science, I have no idea how they did it, you know, 20, 30 years ago. I mean, the guy was almost had his foot on my chest, literally ripping the molar out of my mouth, not to go into gory details, but without the, I felt no pain at all. Absolutely none. <laughs> so I'm kind of astonished. Um, uh, but um, have you ever had a tooth pulled? Oh, I have. I have. So I've, I have empathy with you. I, I mean, I think years ago they did it the same way, but minus the drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I still yeah. have flashbacks, uncomfortable flashbacks uh, about around the sort of the drill noise, because I can still hear it in my head and I can still kind of taste the burning sensation. And I still um, can imagine it in my mind's eye, the guy with the pliers actually taking it, but, but, but. Um, the anti-inflammatories and pain and all of that stuff has been absolutely fantastic. So thank you to emergency dentists um, of Dublin. Anyway, what we're going to talk about today um, is not quite as dramatic. It, in some ways it is uh, as dramatic because the DPC, uh, your office, has published its annual report for last year. There is a massive amount in it. We won't have time to get through it at all today. I'm going to get to quite a bit of it, though, um, a short. I just wanted to ask you on the top, though, um, a topical issue this week, which is around the mother and baby homes. Um, the your department there was some interaction between your office and the department um uh, some weeks back in general and we know now that the recordings uh, that were taken uh, backups have been found in general do you think that they should be protected from deletion under data protection law I, th I think the first thing to say about all of this is that it's a very difficult and challenging situation for all concerned, because you'll recall this commission of investigation when it was established in 2015 understood that the rules of the game were that um, they would complete their work, their files would be transferred over to the sponsoring minister, the minister for children, uh, and they wouldn't be opened then to the public uh, for, for 30 years. Um, and at the point where the Commission commenced its work, the provisions of the 2004 Commissions of Investigation Act specifically um, uh, provided for no right of access in, in respect to the work mm. uh, for data subjects. And of course, during the lifetime of the Commission, that was amended by the 2018 Data Protection Act. Mm. The section 198 in that 2018 Act modified um, the uh, provisions around access and said the right could only be restricted to the extent proportionate and necessary. So opening up the idea that the rights would apply, um, but, but subject to a proportionate and necessary restriction only. So I think there's a diff difficult situation here in that um, the Commission of Investigation operated on one basis and then during that process last autumn where the 2020 Mother and Baby Homes Act was being enacted, it became apparent that the GDPR would absolutely have to be factored in, that individuals mm -hmm. did have rights, albeit if restrictions had to be applied, they would have to be applied and explained. So um, in, in terms of the question that you're asking, I think we have to be open to the idea, and I and my office are, that the Commission of Investigation, in terms of the statutory remit it was given under the 2015 order that created it, it may have been correct in terms of its view that the audio files had to be deleted. Um, but the challenge becomes if you're deleting those audio files in circumstances where there's no transcript of them mm. and <clears throat> where the testimony of the individual who, who gave the testimony 
is preserved only in a summary mm. uh, or a questionnaire created by the commission itself and, and never given an opportunity to view and check that. Yeah, and, that, and that's their wider uh, concern. That's the people who are uh, upset about that. That's their wider concern. But from, I guess, where those different parts of legislation and clash you mentioned to 2015 with GDPR uh, in uh, now I mean at the time um, I think a month ago um, I think the position of your department of your office and you'll correct me if I'm wrong was that it was necessary for the department to demonstrate why in all the circumstances of this commission it would be necessary to restrict rights of access now and how in sealing those records it can safeguard the rights of citizens to access their own information particularly where the necessity and proportionality of that act key measurements under GDPR has not been defined. So um, what I'm wondering is whether you have had any response or feedback from the department on that question. So we've engaged both directly with the Commission of Investigation and also with the Department of Children. And we've had extensive responses and extensive back and forth. And the situation has been evolving very rapidly. Uh, from the point of view of the DPC, the Commission of Investigation has accepted that the GDPR does apply to it. Um, and it has indicated that it is responding to subject access requests from individuals who have submitted them to them. Uh, and so we've been copied by the Commission in terms of uh, correspondence indicating that it has responded. Now, um, complainants that have come to the DPC, we haven't heard from them yet as to whether they're satisfied ultimately with the response they got. But the Commission of Investigation has accepted that the GDPR applies and has cooperated with our office in terms of the range of inquiries we have. The, okay. position, the position is going to be far more complex in terms of the department, because the sponsoring department for this commission of investigation is now taking over the archive from the start of next week. Um, and it's going to be critically important that they don't make any blunt or sudden moves without fully understanding what it is they're doing with the information that they've acquired because the commission of investigation is the one with the expertise in its own archive mm. the commission of investigation also understands its own reasons in the round and its justifications for why it did what it did in respect for example of the audio recordings which mm. have now been retrieved um, and it, and it seems possible to me that part of the thinking of the commission uh, related to the fact that in giving testimony and, and telling their narrative, um, individuals, as part of their narrative, it may have been that they accused a third party because that is part of their story. Um, and, and of course, the terms of the Confidential Committee were such that witnesses wouldn't be challenged. Um, and uh, clearly there was no legal representation going to be had for any third parties. That might be named. So th there are a lot of complexities in what that commission of investigation was doing, how it was intended to do it, that now need to be carefully understood mm. in terms of, of giving effect to rights. But it's very important, as you said earlier, there, there has to be a starting point that people do have rights to personal data. But I, I am saying equally, one must be careful in giving effect to the rights that one understands all of the factors uh, pertaining to any particular records or personal data. Is okay, so so just to circle back to the to the very first question, which will be focused on in terms of the the actual the backup recordings. So there's no determination yet, really, from your office, or no specific advice as to whether or not those backup recordings like must be um, retained uh, and not deleted. We haven't come to a definitive conclusion on that. Mm. Uh, we, we are open to the submissions that were made to us by the Commission as to why it was absolutely correct what it did. However, we have to work with reality. And the reality is that they have been retrieved and they are being passed uh, to the Minister for Children. And I think it's clear from, from what we've seen stated publicly from the Minister that his concern is to get back to a point where the personal data is at least available and then the choices in accordance with the wishes of the data subjects themselves, while also respecting any third party rights issues that may arise, can be dealt with. 
Mm. And so I think we accept that that's not an irrational or unreasonable starting point for the minister, that we've been restored back to a position where there are at least now choices as to how to proceed, as opposed to the position, position that pertained up to last week, where it was understood the data was gone. That's yeah. the end of that. So we want to now continue our engagement with the Department of Children to ensure um, that it is across all of the factors it needs to be in looking at this complex situation um, and that it's putting in place the appropriate safeguards uh, that it needs in the round mm. uh, in terms of respecting rights. Moving on to the annual report, there's a huge amount in it. I'm going to uh, ask you about some of the, um, the stuff in it. A couple of uh, things that jumped out at me, a few smaller side items which you're kind of interested in. Uh, the postponement of a few scheduled big tech projects were mentioned in the report. One of them, what, um, most of them were related to Facebook. One of them, as we know, which was well covered, was the Facebook dating. Uh, scenario last February when your office cancelled uh, Valentine's Day um, uh, because they they hadn't given you uh, enough information about how that was going to work. The other one, the other ones I wasn't aware of, um, that was it was an election alert feature that Facebook had planned Europe wide, um, which your office, the report suggests that your office was concerned that there wasn't enough information on how all of the data around that would be used and there was a risk somewhere down the line that maybe it could even be used um, uh, in relation to, to ad support as well. And then there was a third one about, uh, I think it was to do with um, uh, suicidal ideation and Facebook had a plan that not only were they going to moderate the content, but there was an also another step where they might try to contact third parties. And I think you stepped in and uh, said that we're not quite sure about that bit and then they came back and said well we'll just use it to, to content to, to moderate content you said that was okay um have i summarized those those changes correctly you've done a great job and okay very yep that's where it was at so it, it's kind of interesting i think people are very interested by um by by this process where you know a big company like facebook will come along with uh, ideas for new features and we'll check some of those against your office or the office of another ju jurisdiction um, and that these changes can happen. It's kind of interesting. I mean, they, these, these examples were quite interesting as well. They were interesting. I mean, I think when we first raised the election day reminder feature uh, with uh, Facebook, they were a little bit surprised. They didn't see it as a data protection or, mm. or privacy issue. Um, and they couldn't understand why there might be an issue about it from a data protection authority point of view. But as you know, um, partly following on from Cambridge Analytica uh, and otherwise, there's been a huge concern at EU and Irish level around the regulation of political advertising in the run up to elections on social media platforms. Um, and we were concerned in relation to the sudden appearance of this feature which Facebook saw as something that was really just simply about getting out the vote, mm. increasing participation. We were concerned given the way the algorithms work in terms of pushing sponsored stories or political ads to individuals that there could be inferences drawn in relation to someone engaging with the election day button that they had voted and the types of um, stories or sponsored stories or ads they might have engaged with. So um, the position remains that Facebook is due to further engage with us on it to give us further information. Uh, they did assure us at the time that uh, they didn't intend it to operate in the way that we suggested it might operate uh, and that there wouldn't necessarily be a linking of um, the types of sponsored stories or political ads in an individual engaged with and the fact of their voting but nonetheless uh, uh, sorry and because also they were mentioning that there was academic interest in this feed mm. well we really want to understand more well what will you share with academics and and at what point so that's that's where it remains and um, we we were satisfied and happy that facebook volunteered to uh withdraw it or not roll it out uh, and actually i think next week we're due to have the next engagement with them on it um, um, and we'll try and get answers to all of our questions before it rolls out. 
Mm. If it rolls out, I should okay. say. Okay, that's interesting. I just thought, yeah, yeah, if it rolls out, I, I just thought that uh, there were some interesting examples. I think there was another couple of a, a feature moderation, I think it was to do with Google Voice. Um, and the example given in the report was, it suggested, and you correct me if I'm wrong here, that now with uh, my Google Smart uh, device, I can orally ask it to delete um, today's conversations or the most recent conversation. Was, was that anything? Did you guys have anything to do with that? Oh, yeah, we did. I, I mean, you, you remember? That there was quite an issue arose in relation to voice assistant type features used by various platforms. Mm. Uh, I, I think Apple came into the mix initially in terms of stories reported that um, uh, the uh, engineering staff in uh, the big platforms were actually listening to... Oh, this, this was to do with the testing, wasn't it? The, yeah. And it was they hadn't, they hadn't been clear and, enough about telling people, yeah. That's it, about the voice training and that there hadn't really been transparency about that percentage. Uh, and of course, the assertion was, and, and it's true in many cases, that individuals could potentially be identified, uh, both from their voices and the content. So we did engage in, in a considerable project, not just with Google, but across the platforms, and also as part of the European Data Protection Board, in terms of drawing up guidelines that platforms would need to comply with around mm. various technologies. And you're right, one of the uh, improvements that Google has made is that deletion based on voice command. Um, but there was also a, a big issue across all of them with misactivation. So mm. uh, triggers that activated the voice recording uh, in- St Still happens, yeah. Because uh, um, my house is full of these devices. Um, uh, and, I'm, and I'm unapologetic about it. I find them to be quite useful. Um, apart from the fact that they're now de facto radios, when's the last time you actually bought a radio? Now, now you, you kind of just play it on your smart speaker. But you're, but you're right, th there still are quite a few misactivations. Yeah, uh, uh, and so some of the platforms have taken a different approach to that issue of uh, actual engineers listening to the voice recordings and some of them have stopped doing it. Mm. Others have continued doing it, but they're very transparent about it. And then uh, another platform, again, gives users the choice. They explain that it's a good thing that they can better train the technology and improve it if, if a certain percentage of people allow the recordings be listened to, but they leave it as a choice of, mm. of the user. So I think there's been a significant improvement in that area, uh, and clearly it was needed as well. Okay, okay. Um, moving on to some of the, um, the big tech platforms in general, there's quite a bit in the report uh, about this. First of all, one of the issues, and it's been quite topical recently, there was a big issue that your office dealt with uh, between WhatsApp and Facebook. Uh, you know, what WhatsApp and Facebook investigation you last? Because there are, I think, four, 14 of them uh, between WhatsApp, Facebook, and uh, Instagram uh, that your office is looking to at the moment. But there was one in particular that caught the imagination. That was the integration of data between WhatsApp and Facebook. We've seen in the US where people, uh, WhatsApp has actually lost couple of million users because uh, they made it clear that if you didn't accept the new terms in the US or outside the European Union to allow for the integration of more data between Facebook and WhatsApp, that you wouldn't be able to use WhatsApp anymore here within, within the EU, that that hasn't applied because your office made clear, I think it was two years ago, that and they couldn't do it. But Facebook has never given up on their ideal of integrating it a little bit more and I'm wondering where that sits between you at the moment, between your office and Facebook on that issue. Yeah, and of course, you will recall, Adrian, that this goes back to the merger between WhatsApp and Facebook that was approved by the EU at the time that the merger was approved by the EU. Facebook and WhatsApp said they didn't have the technology to match up accounts anyway, and so it wasn't an issue. Uh, and of course, then shortly after the merger was approved, WhatsApp announced the following August that it was amending its terms of service to uh, now provide for sharing of data with uh, Facebook, the, the parent of its new family. And you'll recall equally that the EU Commission fined uh, Facebook, uh, I think it was 110 million in relation to that issue around uh, the information that it provided to the Commission when it was approving the merger. Nonetheless, of course, the merger stands. 
uh, it, it's quite correct that uh, I don't doubt that Facebook and hasn't given up on the idea of the data sharing. But nonetheless, there has been no progress in terms of WhatsApp convincing the DPC uh, that it as the controller of the data of users of WhatsApp um, should share it with Facebook. Uh, they've made no substantive approach to us uh, on it in recent times, uh, and it really hasn't progressed. And of course, mm. the privacy changes or the change to the so-called privacy policy, we use data protection policy in the EU that they announced recently, it was reconfirming that for EU users, there is no sharing as between the WhatsApp controller uh, and the Facebook controller. Of mm. course, you know, now they've had to pause um, implementing that new policy amid confusion about which provisions of it apply to EU users and which to the US, mm -hmm. uh, amongst other things. But, but the position remains the same. There's no sharing of EU user data between the controllers. Okay, well, that's that's very interesting, actually. Um, I, I, thanks for enlightening us on that. Um, sticking with WhatsApp, um, Twitter was the first big tech company to uh, earn a fine from your office in December. Um, it's understood that you, the WhatsApp, uh, you, there's an Article 60 process underway with WhatsApp where your office has made a preliminary decision on one of the investigations in, into WhatsApp, and that has been sent out to other European data protection offices. Um, it's reported in um, the European publication Politico in, in December that the range of that uh, fine would be between 30, and million, 30 million and 50 million euro. And one of the deputy commissioners from your office made it clear that it wasn't you guys who were, who were briefing on that. Nevertheless, I should ask you two things. First of all, are you expecting that um, back soon from the other European offices? And second, um, that what unnamed European officials have been talking about of a, a fine in the range of 30 to 50 million euros, does that sound realistic? So in, in terms of where the process is at, you're right. We so-called Article 60 draft decision through to the other EU DPAs uh, at the end of last year. They had until the 20th of January to come back with any relevant and reasoned objections they might want to lodge to the Irish DPC's draft decision. Seven objections and eight sets of comments were lodged by the deadline. The DPC is now engaged in an intensive process ex of examining the range of objections and comments uh, because ultimately the goal of this process for us is to drive a consensus position. Um, and uh, we've had to re revert to WhatsApp on, on, on a number of issues that have arisen in, in the course of this process and are waiting to hear from them. But in due course and in the next couple of weeks, we will go back to the EU DPAs with our considered position on which of the objections meet the definition of relevant and reasoned, and then any on which we have to engage on the merits, what our position is, whether we intend to follow the objections or whether we um, would suggest those objections shouldn't be followed and our reasoning as to why. Um, and, and so as part of that process, then we will try to bring the 27 DPAs to a consensus position such that the decision can then be adopted. Of course, if we cannot drive that consensus position uh, and certain of the concerned supervisory authorities maintain their objections, notwithstanding the additional information and reasoning we've put to them, then we would have to trigger the Article 65 process, as it's called again, which, as you know, is the dispute resolution process. It falls then to the European Data Protection Board itself to unravel the dispute in relation to the positions. Mm -hmm. And the mooted 30 to million, 30 million to 50 million range? Uh, I, I couldn't possibly say because as I've said to you before, the, the fine uh, falls out of the infringements that are found and then the assessment under Article 83 of the gravity, nature and duration and mm. on, on, until the process is complete. Um, I can't say, but what I can tell you, of course, is you know what the nature of the inquiry is. It's an inquiry that would affect all of the data subjects of WhatsApp in Europe because it relates to a very substantive examination of the transparency obligations 
under Articles 12, 13 and 14, so in respect of non-account holders potentially as well, um, and those provisions, as you know, under the GDPR are subject to the higher level uh, of fine if there are infringements found. So mm. it gives you some perspective on it. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a much bigger uh, issue, uh, much more substantive issue uh, than maybe the Twitter one um, in December. Um, we know, by the way, that WhatsApp has given its own guidance because it it's, its most recent uh, financial uh, results uh, it, it published that they had put aside 77 million euro for what it expects to be administrative sanctions and fines and um, probably mostly uh, in this country here so we know that they are expecting to pay a substantial amount of money facebook as well um uh, one little nugget in their most recent results they said that they were expecting uh, to pay over 300 million euro in uh, fines in europe this year the majority of which would be expected to be um, in uh, in Ireland, which is its main country of uh, regulation. Um, I have to put the same question to you. Do, does that sound realistic? Well, look, you, you said uh, at the top of introducing this topic that there are a significant number of investigations into Facebook and related companies. Uh, and of course, not least of these, the uh, currently stalled inquiry we have into Facebook's transfers from Ireland to the US. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there are a lot of different inquiries relating to different processing operations in train. Again, I can't say, and, and I think as a data protection authority, we always find the speculation around fines um, not particularly helpful because it's not necessarily where the issues are always at either. Um, you know, it's, it's what it, it does resonate with people, though. People, I mean, you will have seen that from, for example, the Twitter fine in December. The, the rationale for the fine was laid out. A lot of people agreed with it, but there was definitely pushback and blowback from, um, uh, from other uh, quarters, a lot of European ones as well, because rightly or wrongly, the quantum of a fine is regarded as, you know, um, indicative. Indicative of what, I suppose, I mean, the fine has to be relevant to the infringement found and then it has to be proportionate as well as uh, dissuasive and capable of acting as a deterrent. So you're right, we saw some of that commentary around Twitter and often what we hear people asking us, which is the wrong question is, you know, are you going to sock it to that platform? And it isn't about the platform, it's about a specific data processing operation and potential infringement that, that's in scope in the given inquiry. Um, so I think there are, there are misunderstandings. Fines are very important and that's why they're included uh, under the GDPR, but I'm just making the point, they're not, they're not ultimate mm. everything uh, and, and you have to get to the point where you've got the clear reasoning and the clear findings of infringement before uh, they come onto the horizon. I think you and I have talked before as well, using transfers as an example. Um, what's going to have more effect on an organization, a prohibition on, on data free flows or a fine? Mm. So, so sometimes the corrective measures uh, are equally as important. And actually today, uh, coincidentally, the DPC has published the decisions that it's issued under the 2018 Act, uh, and quite a number of those involved fines. But what you'll see when you look through those decisions today on our website is, in, in the case of all the organisations on which we imposed fines, we also set out detailed corrective measures, and we're supervising uh, the implementation of those measures. It's, it's quite tedious work. It's work that nobody will give us any congratulations for. But this is the important work in terms of correcting what we found was mm -hmm. in the investigation. The fine is important too. I acknowledge your point that it resonates for people uh, and it also creates that, that, that shock for an organization. Um, but I, I'm merely saying it's not the only thing mm -hmm. and, and speculating about the quantity of fines that might be imposed against one multinational is simply um, not going to happen, I suppose. Okay, well, uh, you mentioned um, Facebook and transfers and the uh, 
things like standard contractual clauses. And we all know there's a case in parked in the High Court at the moment. It's on appeal, actually. Um, uh, and that is probably due to be heard or to be resolved somewhat soon. There's a whole podcast we could do on that. I'm not going to go into it here. The, I guess there still is a question in some people's minds as to what um, ordinary people will or will not be able to do should the High Court uh, agree with your preliminary, preliminary decision with regard to Facebook and uh, transfers across the Atlantic after all that's happened and what, how their daily life will change. I mean, I don't expect that's up to Facebook in a way because it's up to them to regulate their own legal uh, behavior in terms of how they transfer data. But um, are there any, if, you, if we were just having a chat here, is there anything that you would say to me uh, that is obviously not will obviously change in terms of how I use Facebook if um, the, the the current High Court uh, challenge to your decision isn't upheld. So yes, of course, Facebook judicially reviewed the hearing in that judicial review was heard in December, and as you say, we're awaiting judgment on that. And in fact, the judgment. Uh, won't be deciding the substance of, of the issues. It will be deciding whether uh, the grounds that Facebook cited in its judicial review, which was that um, uh, initiating the inquiry was premature, that there was prejudgment in it and so on, it will be deciding those matters. Uh, and importantly, it will be deciding whether to lift the stay on the inquiry and whether the DPC can continue. Um, you're correct that it's not for me to say what the effect would be in, in terms of a disruption to data free flows, and nor could I, because it could be different in respect of every and any organization. Some organizations, undoubtedly, it has been an option for them to switch to cloud providers that are EU based and, and, and not to have any recourse to transfers uh, to the US as an example, but they're probably in the minority. For other organizations, they would deem it uh, to be essential. Um, I think what we can say in general terms uh, is that data free flows are incredibly important. We live in a globalized world. We live with an internet that is entirely globalized uh, and we've grown accustomed to data free flows. Um, and if you look at the um, concern that Brexit has given rise to in terms of data free flows, and as we contemplate at what the disruptions might be between Ireland and Northern Ireland and Ireland and the UK, e even around law enforcement and public sector contexts alone, aside from commercial, uh, we know that the uh, issues are considerable. And at the Irish High Court hearing, um, in the application case for a reference that the Irish DPC brought, there was quite a bit of time spent um, looking at the trade implications that would arise mm. in, in circumstances where transfers can't happen. But to answer your question, there was an interesting um, presentation given by the judge rapporteur on the CJU case, uh, Judge Thomas von Danvitz, recently at a Data Protection Day event in Germany uh, on the 28th of January. Um, and that issue of trade and impacts was raised with him. Um, and he, he basically said that's as maybe, but the law and the charter of fundamental rights and the standard that the EU has set down for itself is such that it means that there will and may be cases where transfers have to hold. Mm. Um, and I suppose what that showed is the CJU isn't deaf either to the idea that there are significant implications on trade, but it is saying that fundamental rights mm. uh, and, and the rule of law in the EU um, has simply got to be factored into it. Well, I mean, that tension has been there for some years now, safe harbour, privacy shield. I mean, it seems, it feels to me that for the best part of a decade and maybe beyond that, there has been um, a tension and a policy negotiation and a tonal negotiation between a lot of uh, different competing interests within Europe, even if you leave the US alone, as to what uh, the EU's ultimate block position is with regard to how it deals with data, whether it, it's the commission is slightly more focused on trade, CGU can't be, it 
you know, interprets uh, the law uh, as it sees fit. And we're seeing a little bit, you mentioned Brexit, you, uh, you mentioned the UK and Ireland, we're seeing a little bit of that now as well, because the last time I spoke to you about the prospect of adequacy for the UK as a third country, you were neutral on it, but you, you weren't especially, you didn't especially think uh, at the time, it seemed to me anyway, that they were definitely on a course to get it. Yet the commission has now given a very strong indication that uh, the UK is on track um, to for an adequacy decision on the basis of the laws that it has, despite um, you know European Court of Human Rights concerns over uh, surveillance. And as I'm sure you're, you, you will tell me, that European Commission uh, position will go to um, you know to be reviewed by the European Data Protection Board and, and to member states. So so you may have a a say in that uh, in in the near future. What, what's your position or your view on that? So you're right, the European Data Protection Board gets to give a non-binding opinion to the EU Commission on the two draft adequacy decisions, GDPR and law enforcement, that they've published. And, and based on experience, and I've been through a few rounds of this with the EU Commission, of opinions of what was the Article 29 Working Party, now the EDPB, the EU Commission does engage extensively with the opinions of the board, and it will want to address any deficits of information the board might say exist in terms of the evidence presented and so on. So I, I, I expect there will be a lively engagement, but I think the important thing to say from my perspective is that we haven't started that process yet as a European Data Protection Board in terms of detailed review of the evidence and, and commencing uh, the giving of the opinion to the commission but what I can see as a preliminary point is that the EU Commission has proposed an evidence-based approach to its decision. It has published comprehensive draft decisions. It has clearly engaged extensively with evidence. So even if it is the case that ultimately the DPC or the board or anyone else might interpret the evidence differently in terms of a conclusion, um, what is important, I think, is that there's a good first step taken here and, and that the detailed evidence is in front of us. And I think this is, again, another example where the superficial commentary that you often see on these matters, the automatic, oh, that's rubbish. How can the EU Commission suggest the UK is adequate? Nobody should be saying that until they've engaged extensively with the evidence uh, that the EU Commission has presented and the detail of what those European Court of Human Rights findings were and what mm. addressed since those findings issued uh, and so on. Um, so I, I, I think in terms of what I would say, we will engage in this process as part of the European Data Protection Board. We will look at it very carefully. We'll be forthright in giving our views. Uh, but but I'm pleased at least that there's an extensive evidence base with which we can engage uh, in the first instance on the table. Yeah, I mean, all those points very well taken. I guess it's just that the Commission, this comes against the backdrop of, the Commission would have always been um, very keen in promoting, for example, Safe Harbour, Privacy Shield. It does take, it, it is, it wants us all to move forward completely understandably. Um, but it is often its determination of something is often checked by the CJEU ultimately. And I suppose there might be some speculation now that, well, if it goes ahead with an adequacy decision here, maybe some of them will be the same elements that you're talking about in terms of uh, you know instant negative reaction. But one or two of them will 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 challenge it. And is there not a good chance that that this ends up in the same way? You know? Look, uh, the EU Commission is well able to speak for itself and it's yeah. well able to defend itself where it wants to. But I would just say to you, on, on Safe Harbour, the EU Commission had already concluded there were significant deficits with Safe Harbour. And indeed, it was a 2013 report of the EU Commission on the deficits in Safe Harbour uh, that the CJU relied on in large part in terms of striking it down. In terms of the privacy shield, you, you'll recall, and this was a big part of the reference case that the Irish DPC brought, you'll recall that the EU Commission did, in, in bringing forward the proposal for the Privacy Shield, attempt to address that whole issue of redress for 
um, EU persons in the US by creating, and they had to negotiate hard to get it, this, mm. e, this ombudsperson in the US administration that, that would handle complaints from EU persons. Now, ultimately, the CJEU said, no, that's not good enough. It, it, it doesn't meet the threshold for an independent judicial authority. It, it's far too entrenched in the US administration. Um, but, but I suppose the EU Commission proposed and negotiated what it could. Um, and, and I'm not defending that, and ultimately the CJU has spoken, and of course we ourselves had our position on that aligned with what the CJU came out with um, in the decision. But, uh, you know, I think you're acknowledging there are always those tensions. You want the EU highest standards maintained, but you equally, equally want to live in the real world and have data free flows if possible. Um, and sometimes I think there are elements uh, of, of a leap of faith in terms of what they have to do. Um, mm. Now, it, it, you know, I, I don't think there's any question of the EDPB allowing something that ultimately uh, falls well short in our view of, of standards required there's no question of us letting that go, but but you'll recall the Article 29 had its opportunity uh, to express its opinion and did express doubts uh, in relation to the privacy shield. Mm. I mean, in, in Ireland, uh, uh, more widely, the vast majority of businesses you talk to, you know, they don't want to be faced with a headache of uh, of an adequacy, an adequacy problem with uh, the UK or law enforcement or public sector bodies, as you mentioned. I mean, the person taking the bus from Belfast to Dublin, if we're ever allowed to take a bus uh, again, um, when we get out of the pandemic, I mean, you know, uh, we've raised that issue on this podcast before that the, the, the potential ramifications of the lack of an adequacy decision could have kind of unforeseen far reaching effects on the lives of a lot of normal people here. So nobody really wants to see that happen. At the same time, we don't really want to go get into a um a scenario where it's ultimately dragged back down to cju and and, and thrown out because we didn't uh, we didn't do our, our homework on it uh, you know totally agreed uh, nor do we want to get into a scenario where rights aren't adequately protected either and and the eu ends up diluting those rights out of a sense of pragmatism i think that's what we all want to avoid mm. uh, as well i mean i think you've called it right in many articles that you've written uh, about the various litigations the Irish DPC has been involved in in this. The solution ultimately doesn't come from data protection authorities, nor from any complainant that might raise the issue. It, it has to happen at, at a political level and, and there have to be negotiations that, that create sustainable solutions. I, I distinctly remember your predecessor. I remember meeting him in a hotel in um, near Houston Station because I was he was commuting up all the time from uh, uh, from where is it Port Arlington? Port no, Arlington, Port Arlington yeah. yeah. And I remember he he left me with one phrase that I never forgot because I was asking him about some of these really fundamental pressures and tensions between the, the way EU jurisprudence was uh, progressing and the US rhetoric on security and the war against terror. And he was kind of caught in the middle. That was when a lot of this stuff around the big tech companies and data transfers and stuff was starting. And he just said, look, in many ways, this is just kind of above my pay grade. These are international agreements that are negotiated between sovereign nations. And if they can't agree on the basics and the fundamental, there's, there's no real magic fix that I can do to, you know, to knit them together. Having said that, he did, and that's that's why um, he was explaining that as some of the basis to why he was referring some stuff to the high court um, at the time and, and, and on to uh, to European courts. But having said that, you know, he still was caught uh, there in the middle and he did have to uh, take a position on things. And that's the position that you've been in, you know, to an extent over the last six, seven years as well. Yeah. And, and actually the position that Billy, who had a very sophisticated understanding of this talk at the time was endorsed by the high court it was actually when that first complaint about facebook transfers mm. the snowden disclosures came in billy pointed out that the provisions of of eu and as transposed into irish law uh, were such that he was obliged to decide any complaint 
in line with the binding EU instrument. And because it was a binding finding uh, in terms of safe harbour, he was obliged to, to decide the complaint. And the High Court acknowledged that Billy had steadfastly uh, uh, applied the law. And of course, the reason why Judge Hogan then went on to make the reference is that he pointed out that the EU charter was now in play at legal force since 2009. Uh, and therefore he felt that a reference to the CJU to see if the charter uh, should affect the way in which Billy approached the complaint mm -hmm. was relevant. And of course, ultimately the CJU said, yes, it is. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's just a very interesting um, backdrop to all the things we're talking about. There's only two well, th two other things I wanted to raise qu quickly with you. One is uh, on a cookie investigation, a sweep that your office did toward the end of, I think you did it in December 2019, but then you, you, you published a report last April with some pretty alarming uh, um, findings, uh, including the, the healthcare companies. I remember reporting at the time that because of the cookies were allowed to be uh, present on websites, not really managed in a proper way, it was having the effect that healthcare companies, for example, were vulnerable to sharing details of people's illnesses with uh, Google and Facebook and, and maybe um, advertising uh, companies. Um, I, the report, the annual report in 2020 does address this a bit and it, it talks about a number of uh, enforcement actions that have now been sent out uh, to companies. But um, how, are companies taking this seriously? I think they are taking it seriously now because it's interesting when we published that guidance on foot of the sweep that we conducted which I, I think you're aware in terms of the sweep of 40 companies, mm. uh, pretty much bar, I think, one, they all got, they all got a, a grade of fail. Um, they were just pre-ticked checkboxes, uh, serious dark patterns, uh, reject all buttons that purported to allow an, an individual to reject cookies, but which actually didn't work. Mm. Uh, the cookies were still... Um, the cookies still landed and so on. So we just found widespread issues in every website that we had selected to review. After we published the guidance, the uh, colleagues in the DPC that uh, produced the guidance, they were in demand left, right and centre. And I haven't counted them up, but they must have done 20 substantive webinars uh, with all sorts of representative bodies because they realized when we said we're going to give a layoff now of six months and then we're starting enforcement uh, that it sounded serious. And so they did a whole range of webinars. Um, so organizations are taking it seriously. I've been in receipt over the last uh, six months of letters addressed to me from all sorts of organizations writing in saying, dear Miss Dixon, I just want to let you know what we've done on foot of your cookies guidance. Uh, and telling us about the changes they've made proactively. Um, and this is actually very helpful. So you're right, what we have done uh, on, on, on foot of our commitment that we were going to start enforcing is we issued a, a series of enforcement notices um, towards the end of last year. Happily, none of them have been appealed. Um, and now we're just at the tail end of completing our review of whether they've complied with the terms of the enforcement notice and what they were directed to correct. And so far our review is indicating very promising results. We can see mm. some of the websites that had the egregious pre-ticked boxes uh, and all sorts of issues going on have, have corrected uh, now what they're doing. So I think it's worked. It's again, another example though, of how labor intensive it is to enforce the law. We will get on now with another suite of, of, of companies and we will include the big internet platforms as they're often the most searched and accessed websites in Ireland by users. Uh, and we will continue to, to enforce until I suppose we, meet, we reach a critical mass point where we can see organizations mm. have tipped over now into doing this properly in the main. But um, since we published that guidance, for the first time ever, we're now getting complaints in from individuals about cookies. People didn't complain to us about it before mm. because the banners weren't that obvious or maybe they didn't know what the rules were. 
until we publish the guidance. And now, helpfully, people are pointing out all sorts of websites that are really annoying them. Um, in, in so some of the case studies in the annual report, I would urge anybody listening to this, if you want, if you're interested in this, I think there are 16 or 17 of them in the report, and they cover a lot of different topics. But the ones that are often the most interesting are things like direct marketing or the inability to um, sign out of permissions and that kind of stuff. Very, very interesting. Um, actually, one one interesting one uh, it struck a chord with me, and I'll, I'll finish on this. There was one of your case studies was. Um, it was about a bank that uh, I think it was a credit union or a bank that had sent um, incorrectly sent financial details to somebody over WhatsApp, the employee's WhatsApp phone. Um, it wasn't actually that egregious um, a, a breach. My own mortgage application, the house I'm sitting in right now, five years ago, this is this is one for you. And I did, didn't report this at the time. I'll tell you why I didn't report this at the time. So my own mortgage ab application is involved with a well-known financial, financial institution. And back and forth over email. Anyway, I got this email, and it's somebody else's entire financial information. It's another client, right? It's their name, where they work, uh, who they are, what they earn, what they're seeking to borrow, where they're selling, uh, other details like a, a detailed financial form. And the person, I, I had a, just a brief scan of. I can't remember the details, um, and then I emailed the guy back in the financial institution to say think you might have sent me the wrong uh, uh, details and he was mortified and I deleted the application but the reason I didn't report it selfishly at the time was because I thought because if he was embarrassed I might have a better chance of getting the mortgage which I did now I don't know if it was because of that <laughs> but um I would suspect there are a lot of breaches like that inadvertent breach and you list them out in the report I mean, there's there are tables of the different types of breaches and how they happened and whether they're paper-based or electronic but I would say there are an awful lot of inadvertent uh, breaches like that, that that just aren't even reported. That, that may be the case but you're absolutely right because if you look at the table of breach types sure we see breaches that are related to mm -hmm. malware, phishing, hacking uh, and those types of technical issues that arise but by far, the huge majority of breaches that are notified to us are unauthorized disclosures, often in individual type cases like the one that you described. Mm. Um, and I mentioned earlier that today we've published all of the decisions that we've issued uh, under the 2018 Act, including in the cases where we've issued fines. Um, and so many of these authorized disclosures are cases where an organization intended to redact information, but they do it wrong. Um, mm. They don't do it in a way that the information is actually redacted, or they have to redact three documents. They do it on two and forget they didn't do the third. Or a very common occurrence is that um, organizations, particularly public sector organizations responding to access requests or FOI requests, don't realize that someone else's data is stapled onto the back of, of, of a document they retrieve to give out. That's a common one and happens also in terms of, of the issues with, with banks. So mm. you're right. And, and, and people correctly say, but look, you shouldn't just be writing those off as human error. And, and they're right to say that because human error in a data controller organization, which we all are, is still a risk assessment and systems. Mm. So every organization needs to do that risk assessment about their data processing operations. For example, at the Irish DPC, one of our risky operations can be that process of issuing out decisions by registered post where there's two parties and where we're signing mm. off on lots of decisions and registered posting them all in one day. So we have to do the risk assessment on it. And then we have to have systems in place, which may be two people checking each one as it goes into the envelope to make sure we don't make mistakes. And if it's high risk, um, if it's a high risk data processing scenario, you need to start finding solutions, mm -hmm. to what we call human error issues. Um, and, and we're seeing a lot of the organizations that we're engaging with now around corrective measures trying to create those solutions that will be effective. Yeah, and, and that's when you get into issues of budgets and resources that organizations have as well. Oh, and you're, yeah, in, you're into sure. to long held yeah. 
um, you know, internal problems. Look, um, there's an awful lot more that I could ask you about. There were lots of other interesting case studies as, as well, but um, I think that's all we have time for um, today. But thank you very much, uh, Helen Dixon, Data Protection Commissioner, for joining us today. Thanks also to Sky for uh, Broadband for uh, sponsoring this podcast today. And I will be back with you with a fully functional job same time next week. So for me, Adrian Michael, the tech editor of the Irish and Sunday Independent, talk to you again. Bye-bye. The Big Tech Podcast, brought to you by Sky Broadband. Get the power to do more with Sky's best ever Wi-Fi, with lightning-fast speeds rolling out to a million homes.